guys, this is Paul Spirit Reptiles, and what I'd like to talk to you about today is something that's very important, numbers. Numbers don't lie. So if we look at the reptile market, it always points to ball pythons. And do you ever ask yourself why? I mean, why is it that people say the ball python market is down versus the chameleon market or the boa constrictor market or any other type of pet market? They specifically say the ball python market. And today I'm going to tell you why. I'm going to actually throw some numbers your way, and then you can make a decision for yourself if you're choosing to try to go into breeding ball pythons like we have decided, or you just want to have a good pet so you can know which segment that you can get your biggest bang for your buck. So I'll be actually talking about some different charts because I think charts are better because people have a hard time understanding numbers sometimes. But with the U.S. population, and pet ownership in particular, we can see that 48.4% of all Americans own a dog and another 31.9% own a cat. So if we take that, that's 147 million people with a dog and over 97 million people with a cat. Um, there's only about 334 million people in the U.S., I think, as of the date of yesterday when I made this video. But you can see the breakdown for fish, birds is uh, fish is 11%, birds are five and a half percent, and reptiles falls in at three percent. And that's the market, guys. That's that's the market out of all of the Americans that we have. So you can take 334 and multiply it times three percent, and you end up with 10 million people have reptiles, a little over 10 million. Now. That doesn't seem like a lot, but there's a lot of businesses that would love to have that 10 million. And we're gonna discuss ways in which you can get that too. So one of the more effective ways to get it is to look at the total market. So I have a sales and marketing background, so I'll share with you some of the things we do um, in trying to figure out demographics. So um, one of the things we do is we look at market percentage and market volume. And you can look at changes of that over time to determine where to invest your money. And that's what we're talking about when we're talking about breeding anything. Because even if you have a love, you have to, you have to sustain the love financial. And then you can emotionally sustain it because everything is all cuddly and not furry, but smooth. Um, but in particular, if we look at Morph Market. And so this data is from Morph Market as of June the 7th, 2023, around 4 p.m. And it looked at the total number of species volume in Morph Market at that time was 65,107. That's every last animal species, you name it, 65,107. So we can look at ball pythons owning 58.3% of that market volume or market share. Um, the actual volume of ball pythons that are being sold, these were all the, the reptiles and animals being sold, was 37,859. So ball pythons represent almost 60% of the market. And you can look at the other ones. I just kind of grouped them. Invertebrates were three, leopard geckos were three, and 3.3, 3. boa constrictors were 5.5. And you can see their respective volumes in that, guys. So as the ball python market goes, so does the entire reptile industry. Because when there are corporations targeting people, one of the things they do is they look for the lion's share of where that volume or that share is. So who's getting the biggest piece of pie or the biggest piece of pizza? And that's where they're gonna aim their focused, concentrated efforts. And it's always going to be right now at ball pythons. You can tell that by the rack systems that are around. I mean, I know that reptile basics, you know, adubia.com has reptile basics. And then we also have some other cage manufacturers that make cages, but we can look at all of these people. This whole industry is set up about pleasing ball python breeders because they're the ones who are spending the money. Because if we look at 37,859 ball pythons on the market right now, that's a lot. The, the next closest are crested geckos at 4,400, a little over 4,400. And boa constrictors are around 3,500. Um, you see leopard geckos a little over 21 invertebrates of all things are the fastest growing at 2016 then you got corn snakes and all the other reptile species as great as they are only make up 13,600 that's only 20.9 percent so 
if we look at all of that, you got to ask yourself the question of, so why is it that every time I look on the internet, I see that the ball python markets fall? Well, it has. It has fallen compared to where it was around COVID when everybody was at home starting business because they had extra money. They were being paid to stay home. And now all of a sudden, uh, the government says they want their money back. And so it's making things tight. People are out there working and this is harder. Gas is up. Property taxes are up. Everything. I mean, you name it. Um, your tax returns are probably down if you're just filing as an individual or as a family. Um, but if we look at, in particular, because that's another sidebar that we can go into all day. So if we look at animals sold on Morph Market since its inception versus the, those that are currently being sold, and this chart right here, I think this is the most important chart. So if we look at all of the animals being sold, we'll see that ball pythons make up more than 60%. It's 300,000 ball pythons have been kind of sold through Morph Market because again, no one buys anything directly off Morph Market to act as a liaison between the buyer and the seller slash breeder. So over 300,000 ball pythons have been sold. Damn, that's a lot of ball pythons. I mean, that that definitely triggered my interest when I when I saw this a while back when we were deciding to start Spirit Reptiles. And then you can look at the other ones. Um, you can see crested geckos make up 35, boa constrictors 28, leopard geckos 29, corn snakes 21, 21,000. And so you can see invertebrates are at 2016. So, um, guys, I mean, that's just something that that is just intriguing to me. So, over 300,000 ball pythons have been sold, and there's still like 10% on the market right now. So that that tells me one of two things: that a ball pythons are still being sold, and b a lot of ball pythons have been sold. So when people think about snakes, they think about first ball pythons. Now, when I first got into herping. The first thing I thought about was a Burmese python, then a reticulated python, and then a corn snake, and then a milk snake, and, and ball pythons are way down there. And this, ball pythons are recent because of their size, their demeanor, uh, their ease of care, they don't get too big. They, If you can get them to eat, they're perfect pets, right? I, I really feel that way. I love ball pythons. But um, the, the very last thing that we want to talk about is you know, how can we use this information of like where it's been and where it's at right now? We know that the market is down, but let me explain something to you. And I don't know if you've ever heard of the Pareto principle. I got to thank my buddy Matt for introducing this to me about 10 years ago. Um, so the Pareto principle discusses what's called the 80-20 rule. Now the 80-20 rule applies to everything. This is why 20, well, 80% of the budget for streets is spent on 20% of the roads, and then you can take 80, 20 of that, and you can get 4% of the roads, get 80% of that budget, and then you can look at corporations or companies where 80% of the work is done by 20% of the people, and the other 80% do 20% of the work. I mean, there is a phenomenal amount of numbers if you start just putting your mind to 80-20 rule, but 80, the 80-20 rule is what a lot of marketing companies actually target so this is how you determine your niche and we're going to look at ball python niching right now so if we look at the different markets so i broke them up into three different segments so you got pet owner market from zero dollars because some are free up to a thousand dollars that's a, a pet people are comfortable paying for a pet from zero dollars which is free to a thousand dollars our second segment would be for new breeders so new breeders are like like us so our initial investment were to find animals that were between, let's just say for the point of this exercise, $1,001 to $2,500. And then the very last segment would be the collector slash experienced breeder or established breeder. And that established breeder or that collector is willing to pay $2,501 to you name it. It's just a plus sign, right? Because there are some ball pythons. I think uh, Miguel with always, yeah, he has. Miguel with always evolving pythons, he sold a sunset clown for 50 grand off Morph Market. And I was like, what the fuck? That is crazy, but it, it's all true. People aren't making boots out of ball pythons like a lot of people don't like snakes. Like. Uh, but let me tell you something, guys. So if you're in the ball python market and you sell an animal that is up to $1,000, it probably shares a couple of co-dominant, incomplete dominant um, patterns. So it might be pastel, orange dream, inchy, um, yellow bellied, 
uh, let's see, acid, any of those non-recessive traits. You can probably get them for under $1,000. That's the pet industry. <clears throat> so there are, I mean, from this right here, you can see that that's over 81.5% of the ball python market. So as that goes, so does the market. I mean, because people are putting their money in there and a lot of people, once they get established, they don't reinvest. So, I mean, it's just one of the things that happens, right? But you have to continue to innovate. And you have to continue to evolve if you want to stay afloat in a business, period. That's not just reptiles, it's all businesses. So let's look at the markets that you should actually look into if you're trying to be a breeder and you should hyper-focus on these. So it should be in the new breeder category. So animals that are a thousand and then going into the collector and the established breeder and above 2,500. So if you're choosing to invest, which is what we're doing, I'm just gonna put it out there. So we did have some code dom well, some incomplete, let's just call them incomplete dominance. So we got a bunch of animals that are incomplete dominance, but about, I'm gonna say this time last year, when we were just really toying around with the idea, we decided, hey, we're just gonna shoot for recessives. That's not to say that we still don't buy those incomplete dominant um, pattern morphs, but we just really look for recessives or very rare incomplete dominance, very rare. Like, so you can search on morph market and you can see the availability. It'll tell you right there. You can look and see for each pattern the number of visuals they have. So this is where the education on head to head, head to normal, visual to head, visual to visual, when it comes to recessive comes in hand. And you gotta learn this because this is where your money's at. So imagine this, a sunset clown. Sunsets are very rare. Clowns are, are very available, but they're both recessive. So it takes work. So even if you buy one at a hundred grams, It'll take you two and a half years probably to get that female up to size of breed. It'll take you a year to get that male up to breed. That's why the males are cheaper than the females. The females lay the eggs, so you can have one female and shoot out six to 10 to 11 eggs. And now you can get your money back, but it's very rare. But just, to, just for shits and giggles, guys. So say if you have a triple recessive, like a hypo desert ghost clown, right? Look on more market for that, over over 20 grand. Now imagine if you just focused on nothing else but trying to hit a quad recessive. And I see people doing it right now. I see them doing it, that's what we're doing. So, all right, so if you have a ghost pie and a desert ghost hypo, you breed those two visuals together and it has to be two visuals. And I, I'm gonna say that's where your investment needs to be. Those and you'll end up with quad head and 100% head for all of them. You don't have to sell those. I mean, you're focused. You're focused on what you're doing. Or you might sell a couple. But if you can have three females and one male, and that would be great. But no matter what you have out of those visuals, every last one of them will be 100% head for a clown, pie, desert ghost, and hypo. And now you can just play the odds of breeding those. You can breed them together and you can just try to play the odds. And as soon as you get one visual for all of those, then now that's the game changer. And now you can work on what would be, I guess, a penta recessive. So five recessives and then a hexa recessive. I mean, so that's where your focus needs to be because that's where the money's at. And even if, like I was telling my coworker because he does agriculture, if, if I shoot for a $20,000 snake in the market, I mean, this is real talk, guys. And I only get $8,000 after two years for that snake. Did I win? Of course I did. I mean, because I was able to hyper-focus, hyper-care for an animal that would have sold for 20 and I got eight versus nothing at all for an incomplete dominant. Now, don't take this the wrong way, guys, but that's the way that it's got to be. It's got to be that way. And you can still have your own projects. You can still do your own things. But if you're trying to make money, that's the route you got to go. And I'm welcome to your feedback because, hey, it is what it is. Um, I'm in Texas, and <laughs> that's just how we think, man. But outside of that, guys, that's all I got. I hope you have a good rest of your day, and join us for the next video. Thank you.